Hello out there, everybody. This is um, Jen, a.k.a. Countess Powers, and I am here today with my lovely friend Kat from Supernatural Beatles channel. Hello. Hello. <laughs> Hello out there. Hello to you all. Yeah. So all good. We just, um, we thought that we would release a sort of Halloween special. <laughs> Make it a little creepy for you guys, you know, not just in yeah. celebration of it. So. Exactly. Yeah. But we're going to warm up to it mm. with some random stuff. Yeah. We got a lot of ran- we got a lot of ground to cover tonight. <laughs> I I only do random. Yes, and I love random. That's why my videos take so damn long to come out because <laughs> I get distracted with four other ones. <laughs> yes. I love it. Okay, so I'm going to start at the beginning because last time you asked me what I thought of Billy, which was an awful question because (laughs) I try not to think about Billy as a person. I try to be really neutral. So this time I'm going to ask you, what do you think of Paul? What I think of Paul, I, wow. Um. I have a lot of respect for him after reading memoirs. Um, I feel like he was a very responsible lad. Um, yeah, I feel like he was kind-hearted and he cared about his bandmates. Obviously, his bandmates loved him. You know, that's what Billy talks about is that he couldn't give the love that Paul had given them. You know, he that that was something he was void void of, and um, so I get the feeling that Paul was a very loving and kind, and maybe even sympathetic, empathetic person. And I think they wrote, you know, they wrote some of their songs. And I think, I think as they got more, as he was getting more evolved, like with Eleanor Rigby. And yesterday, and um, even when I'm 64, you know, I think I think he could have gone really far. What do you, okay. What do you think about about Paul? As a person, yes. I think the phrase "lovable rogue" <laughs> comes to mind. I mean, he was obviously a cad, uh, particularly because he was afforded the opportunity to be one. Mm. You know, because he was very popular with women. Yes. He was the cute beetle, after all. The baby face. But, exactly. But when I did the video on his natal chart, I I sort of sat and thought about him an awful lot because that chart was basically describing the sort of person he theoretically should have been according to his astrology. Mm -hmm. And that's why I asked you that question, because I found myself wondering about it i mean he was only 24 so (laughs) you know it wasn't very old so a lot of the sort of uh qualities that you accumulate Mm. when you're maybe in your 40s or 50s or 60s they weren't there yet well and think about that 24 the numerology goes to six six yeah (laughs) (laughs) there's a surprise (laughs) (laughs) but yeah i mean I think he was actually more skillful than I think Billy gives him credit. Yes. I watched um, a really good uh, little documentary the other day on the early days of the Beatles, and they interviewed loads and loads of people who actually knew them when they were young, Mm -hmm. including a lot of the quarrymen. Yeah. And the thing that they said about Paul was that actually... You know, sort of before he met John, he was a good lad and he always did his schoolwork and he was quite quite a respectable sort of a boy, you mm. know, just sort of pretty straight laced mm-hmm. and just got on with things. I mean, he had a sort of cheeky streak to his demeanor, but he was basically a good kid. And I can sort of see that, you know. Yeah, I can yeah. see it too. Um, definitely. And so, so basically John Lennon's influence kind of corrupted him <laughs> i think pretty much it, it brought out the devil in him yes <laughs> no pun intended <laughs> yes 
um yeah that's i i think it's so interesting that like i said in like one of the comments it gives a whole other meaning to that's written in the stars you know (laughs) yeah it is such an amazing thing that the it's not even a synchronicity it's like a planned thing you know and that's what oh, yeah. makes it even more someone said in the comments on that video you know that it was a, a you know not wishing to be in any shape or form blasphemous with this mm. comment but they'd made a comparison between you know the prediction of paul's coming mm. and with jesus mm. like there was a, a prediction of someone coming that's what they meant and it did feel like that like they were waiting for him. Yeah. So I thought that was really interesting. The, 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 the one thing that does kind of niggle me a bit about him, and I suppose, you know, it was because he was young, but he seems to have had quite a few children mm. that he took very little responsibility for. Yeah. So hmm, he sure that's... got around, that's for sure. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. And then, and then, you know, Billy doesn't seem to want to know them either. And Mm-mm. I don't know. I kind of feel sorry for them, really. Oh, I feel awful for them, you know. But I think it's badass that, that what, Michelle McCartney is a bassist. <laughs> She's oh, like, I think that's fantastic. Ass. Yeah, that's kind of like a F you to, to, you know, Billy not to, you know. But Billy, I understand why Billy doesn't want to take responsibility. Oh, yeah. But... No, I get it. Because it would kind of blow his cover. They got cheated, though, for sure. Oh, yeah. There's yeah. no doubt about it. Yeah. yeah. Ugh. What about Paul's family? Because <laughs> they seem kind of weird. Like, one, they don't seem like they were actually a, like, a legit family. Mm. I mean, none of them look alike. <laughs> no. <laughs> Which I know sometimes does happen. Mm. But two, I just can't really get over the fact that his surviving family members don't really seem terribly bothered that he died. Exactly. Exactly. So it makes you wonder if was he, you know, born for it, you know, um, like, like, I mean, like they knew that he was, he was meant to be a sacrifice or something like that. I don't know. I, I get the same feeling about his family. I, I think it's sad that his mom died, you know, when he was young, but his father is very peculiar. And like we were talking about last time, you know, mm. just him accepting Bill so easily and offering Bill all of his son's items and belongings. And then Mike McCartney, like filling him in on, you know, lost memories and stuff like that. It's just, so weird and it is yeah i i don't know i'm i'm with you on that one i don't think it's right and i i think there's something more to that situation oh yeah there's definitely more to it i mean like even in memoirs Mm. what it's describing is essentially that paul's running around programming everyone he knew to accept his death and his replacement right because you do that don't you you got to think that there were other people programming them, though, too, you know. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. There was some weird stuff going on there, and it was all Definitely. accepted way too readily to be normal. Right. So there's there's, uh, there's more there than I think we will ever get to know. It's very creepy to think about. I, I don't know. Ugh. Yeah. Yeah. I, I'm in agreement with you. I, I can't quite put my finger on it, but it's very peculiar, their family. <laughs> yeah. And what's up with, like, the that documentary he did back in the 70s with the whole McCartney clan, you know, in that pub in there? Yeah. Hello, Billy. <laughs> Whatever that <laughs> yeah, old lady I... says. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And he actually does say there, doesn't he? Um, yeah. That they don't like me. <laughs> Yeah, it does. I remember that. <laughs> yeah. I mean, th- there's an it's admittance just, right there. It's just funny, though, that it's, you know, and it's just Bill. Bill's there in the sea of McCartney's. <laughs> it's just, I 
kind of interesting. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I mean, what must he be thinking? Like, these are all supposedly my family now, and and I'm yeah. a different person now, and I'm meant to know all of their history as well as my own, and I don't know any of it. <laughs> <laughs> right, and then at the same time, too, he had to denounce his own family. Yeah, so whoever the hell they it's are. All me- yeah, <laughs> it's all messed up. It's, <laughs> it's so messed up. It's so backwards and so like, what the, hmm. yeah. <laughs> Sorry, I'll try and restrain my language on this. It's fine. I, I just, <laughs> I do actually make a policy to not swear on my channel because I don't want to yeah. give YouTube any reason for getting rid of my videos. But right. no, that's quite an behave. effort on my part because I swear like a sailor. Yeah. In real life. I, yeah, I, 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 yeah. Sometimes there's no other word exactly. <laughs> to use in the circumstance. <laughs> Quite right. So, okay. Yeah. Let's try this one. Where do you think Paul died? Or do you think he died in any particular um, place? I I believe he died on what that was the, the Junesbury Road or whatnot. Um that's that's I don't know. There, there's there's a lot of different theories about how he died. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, I'm actually really not sure which one I truly believe because memoirs tells us, you know, that the car crash was a big old farce. You know, <laughs> it was a conspiracy to hide the real conspiracy. <laughs> Mm. And yeah, so I'm I'm actually conflicted on that one. What are what are your thoughts on that one? Well, obviously, I made a whole video about it very early on. Yeah, well, exactly. Um, I do think the car crash happened, but I also think that mm. it wasn't enough, and they finished the job with Maxwell's silver hammer, and and I do believe that he died somewhere in Staffordshire. If I had to, you know, bet money on it, as it were. I I tend to agree with that. I think it makes the most sense, um, especially considering the um, elusive, controversial picture <laughs> that goes along with it. You know what what happened to him? Yes. So, yeah. I mean, it makes sense. Okay. It's very sad. <laughs> yeah. It's just sad to think about, you know, because he. I don't know. I feel like he was, he could have done such great things. How skillful a musician do you think he was? Um, I mean, I know that him and Billy play their instrument, their bass differently. Um, I think he was a good musician because you notice he, I notice like he doesn't look down at his finger placing. Yeah. Um, it's one of the things that really gives it away. Yeah. So, I mean, as far as playing um, his instruments, I think he was well-tuned. You know, like like I've said, I believe that they were programmed in Hamburg to just jam out song after song after song after song like a performing monkey. Yeah. Yeah. It was a boot camp. Exactly. Essentially. <laughs> it, was a, it was a boot camp. It was like, we want you to be able to play for eight hours straight. Right. Get, on, Ex- get on with it. Exactly. <laughs> Take some speed and shut up. <laughs> yeah. Well, Frellies and they were on, weren't yeah, they? Yeah, yeah. And um, to find out that all of the other proceeding bands that came to America, they all went over to Germany as well. So, huh, you know, ding, ding, ding. <laughs> Just, yeah. Um, yeah, there was something else going on there, particularly because they were invited over to play and then given nowhere to stay you know really right they were given no amenities they were just like stuck in the back room of some grotty porn cinema <laughs> no. or something or <laughs> sleeping and sleeping in the the theater chairs and stuff yeah 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 you're right about that i mean it, it's it is kind of odd that i think they... it was like a test yeah actually or a trauma it, it, yeah well, it was either that, yes, it's, it, well, it could be both, yeah. I guess, a test and a trauma. But it kind of reminds me of, like, the tradition when you go to a Zen temple mm. 
like because they don't really want you there unless you're very very committed okay they make you sit outside for at least 10 days maybe two weeks and if you're still there sitting zazen you know meditation Mm -hmm. if you're still there outside after like 10 days or two weeks they'll take you in because then you've shown commitment but if you thought do you know what i've I've had enough of this i'm off then they won't take you in Mm. because you'll be gone yeah so it's it's a test of endurance yeah very interesting that their time in hamburg kind of reminded me of that like a test of endurance. Yeah. What will you put up with? What will you suffer through mm. in order to make it in the music business? Yeah. Because they wanted to make sure they were really super committed. That's amazing. That's a great parallel. Wow. Spot yeah. on. Yeah. So, I mean, I believe he was, um, you know, he couldn't read music, but I believe he was talented because he could play by ear. I'm like I said, I'm jealous of people who can do that because I've never been able to. And um, he was able to like pick up the bass and learn how to play it, you know, when they needed a bass player. So I have to give props to him in the musical side of things. I think he was a decent musician. Yeah, I think he was competent. I don't think he was a hack. No. I mean, there's a spectrum, isn't there? A very large, long spectrum between being a session musician mm. who can sight read and just, you know, read something straight off the page, run through it a couple of times, record it, be out the door. Mm. That's one end. And then there's the other end where you're a total loser, a total <laughs> hack. <laughs> and there's a very large spectrum between the two. Yes. So... <laughs> When I hear the word hack, I think of Johnny Cash songs. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> I love that. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> no, I, I just think, you know, that he was competent. He was not a hack, yeah. but he also wasn't session musician quality. You, you know, there's a big spectrum between the two. So, yes. yeah, I think that's where he lies. You know, Billy was a session musician and obviously he reads music and he makes a very big deal out of that in the book yes. and I remember the first time I read that as someone who does read music mm-hmm. and is classically trained I'm like yeah and yep. <laughs> so do I yeah so do millions of other people come on Bill I do too exactly <laughs> I do it's like yeah I I went through the training I know how to I know how to read it <laughs> exactly like, you're you're not special <laughs> yeah I know and um I am in, I am interested actually as to what instruments he actually played or still plays. Me too. Cuz in the book he does mention the piano, the tuba and the clarinet. Yes. Specifically. But he also played the horn, right? Well, or like I'm pretty sure as Vivian we've seen him play recorder. Yes. And I think possibly cor anglais. And trumpet. It looks like a saxophone on Jollity Farm. Is it? Um, I don't know what, it, but it has a baby head at the very at the opening. <laughs> okay, I don't know. I'm going to have to look that up. I don't think I've ever seen him play the saxophone because I would have noticed. I think I play the saxophone. It's my second instrument. Okay. I'm I'm curious actually because like okay, obviously he must play like guitars and bass and drums and stuff like that. Right. But of those instruments which seem to all be wind instruments, mm-hmm. tuba, clarinet, etc. Yep. I wonder how long he kept them up. Does I mean, does he play for the fun of it? Because he can't play as Paul McCartney. Because Paul McCartney didn't play the clarinet. Well, like on his solo stuff, you know, where there's um, a, a tuba or a wind instrument needed, I wonder if he's stepped in. Because he's known to, you know, do, play all the instruments himself and in his recording yeah exactly that's what i'm wondering i wonder one if he ever included any of those other instruments on other albums but didn't say so Mm. or did he just play them for fun or did he just drop them thinking you know screw it you know i'm now a different person who doesn't play the clarinet anymore right doesn't play the tuba so viv's dead now so what's exactly why worry about it well yeah exactly especially after viv as a character died so yeah 
which is sad because Viv was a ray of sunshine. <laughs> I don't know. I, I well, Viv was weird, but I did like the whole Viv thing. Yeah, me too. Yeah, I did like the Bonzos. Mm-hmm. And, and I remember when... Him... Oh, God, it's so sad. I do remember when he died and I... Um, my good friend Ellen at school mm-hmm. and I, we were so sad. We had like a sort of marathon session of listening and watching everything we had. Oh, <laughs> all of the bon- we had like all bonzos all day, Aww. you know, kind of thing. Because <laughs> we were really sad. That's really sweet. And and <laughs> it's sweet, but it's stupid because we were <laughs> celebrating someone that didn't exist. <laughs> a fictional I mean, I know there wasn't. <laughs> Exactly. <laughs> I mean, I know there was another guy who played him who literally was murdered. Yes, I know. <laughs> but, which is another grim thing about this story, Ugh. but still, yeah. you know, there was no Viv as such. Right. <laughs> so, yep. <laughs> Sorry, Ellen. <laughs> oh, that's funny. Um, Someone asked me the other day on one of my videos, can't remember, I can't remember which one it was, but they said that they found it really odd that someone like Paul, you know, post-death was spiritually sort of hanging out with Billy. Yeah. It, I, he just couldn't see why he would stay with him. Mm-hmm. And I don't know uh, whether he was compelled to in some way or whether it's his choice um, or whether he actually is with Billy at all and Billy's just delusional on making this stuff up. Yeah. I don't know. What do you think? Well, um, I think that Billy is um, one who does believe in that stuff. Like you think of back to um, Peter Cox saying that he was talking about John Lennon in the present tense. And even in memoirs, he said that he channeled George, <laughs> you know. Yes, I saw so that. Yes. I what I think personally think why Paul if if it's true why Paul attached himself to Bill is because he dreamt about it he dreamt about Bill and made that connection in like the astral plane or the subconscious level and I believe that he had a connection and because of his astral chart and who he was supposed to be and what his life represented like I can see that he might have attached to Billy because of that you know there could have been magic involved in that there could have been some sort of spell that we you know were obviously not aware of that could have caused uh, Paul to attach to Billy because Bill says that he you know went that feels a, le- a tingle in his left shoulder, and that's that's Paul. <laughs> you know, um, the movement you need is on your shoulder. <laughs> yes, that's what that means. Yes, yeah. that's right. So it's um, I think it's very mystical, and if it is true, I kind of believe like they were bonded together in in the I don't know the astral plane and their souls connected there and he knew that bill was would carry on the mccartney name for him and do it as an actor and he thought he'd hop along for help to help them <laughs> i really don't know okay it's a, it's nuts you know it is nuts yeah what do you think about that i don't know i mean like the only thing i can think is that If you're suddenly killed at 24, I mean, you've sort of been wrenched out of your existence. And maybe you think, well, this is better than nothing because I I feel I've still got stuff to do. (laughs) And in order to resolve any of it, I'm going to have to stick Mm. with this guy, you know, who's going to allow me to somewhat live through him. So he may have kind of felt like he had no choice in the matter. Or it was the best option available yeah. to him, at least. Well, and he, like you said, he might not have had a choice because of the plans that were in store for him in his life. Yeah. Yeah. That's <laughs> certainly, I think he was manipulated into thinking that one way or the other. Magical or mind control or whatever it may have been, mm-hmm. 
I think he felt that way. Yeah. But th that bit about George, though, that's really odd. Because, like, I yeah. always got the impression that Billy and George didn't terribly get on very well. And it makes me think, well, why would George come back to Billy? Is it just because, I mean, let's be honest, George had a tremendous sense of humor. Yeah. Did he come back, you know, for a laugh? <laughs> just to wind him up. Just just to freak him out. Because <laughs> I can really see George doing that. <laughs> oh, that's awesome. I could totally see him too. Oh, George is my favorite Beatle. Yep. I know he's yours yeah, too. Yeah, absolutely um, snap. That is brilliant. I love that. <laughs> that's the only thing I can think I'm, of, that he did it for a laugh. I'm here to rattle your bones. <laughs> Because I really don't think they got on terribly well. That's always been my impression. Yeah. So. Yeah, me too. They were a bit distant. And then when you read the memoirs, you know, like, yeah, it's it's apparent that they they had a strained relationship. <laughs> <laughs> Beetle Bill making a pig of himself. Exactly. And that's what George said. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I think he just sort yeah. of endured him because he felt he had to. I love that bit, actually, yeah. in, um, I think it's in both Let It Be and the Get Back film, uh, where he mm -hmm. goes, I'll be leaving the band now. I, Bye. I know. <laughs> <laughs> and then he writes it in his diary. <laughs> I <laughs> woke up, had breakfast, at lunch, quit the Beatles. Exactly. <laughs> and it's so, that's so, so George. Funny. It's so matter of fact about it. <laughs> So nonchalant, no filter. He just gives it to you. It's excellent. I love that. Yeah, I do. I love that too. Brilliant. <laughs> and you know, like, Bill is so accommodating, it seems, to people and whatnot. And yeah, so I can definitely see the personality clash there. Like, George was kind of like, I don't give enough, you know. And yeah, I believe that's why what happened to him later in love happened to him that that's another story for another day it is that's another yes. video <laughs> it is probably another set of videos <laughs> oh bloody hell <laughs> yeah i know it's it's very sad and yeah yeah it is <laughs> i got a question for you okay so i want to know like you know we were talking about dreams of paul and um yes. that chapter and paul was like he started getting like super scared of his dreams because there were dreams of death. And I just want to know, like, where do you think the source of his dreams came from? The source of his dreams? Like, yeah, like, because it was definitely like a pro, he had prophesied, like, prophesized dreams. You know, he saw Bill in his dream, he saw his demise hmm. where do you think that came from well first of all we only know that because billy has said so that's true so it might not actually be true but let's yeah. just say it is true mm. for argument's sake um i suppose there's lots of different avenues either it's mind control work or it's magical work it's you know mm -hmm. he, he's had the idea suggested to him repeatedly until he believes it Right. Or, you know, quite simply, he may have just some, in some spiritual way, cottoned onto it. You know, you get like a, a sixth sense about things. Right. You know, you get a sense of impending doom or dread about something Yeah. that's about to happen. And then it happens. And there's been plenty of occasions in my life where that's happened. Yes. I think Me it's too. probably all of the above. I don't, I don't think it's any one thing. I think it's probably everything. Yeah. If it is true, I agree. I am. Um, I also oh. kind of think maybe he was just psyching himself out too, you know, because dreams are that. Oh yes. Yeah. I mean, well, let's be let's be very blunt. If he was Virgo ascending, mm. then he's going to be obsessed, isn't he? Yes. With stuff going wrong, with his health, yeah, g going down the chute, losing his hair. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> wow. Yeah. That's classic Virgo stuff. <laughs> <laughs> so, like, I guess what um, kind of, I don't know, in the spirit of Halloween, <laughs> um, 
Like, what do you think about the Faustian bargain that the Beatles made? The Faustian bargain? What, what do you mean? Did it happen? Well, yeah. Like, what, like, what are your feelings about it? Like, how jo- it was just between John and Paul, you know, that Ringo and John weren't included in it. Um, I just, like, what's your reaction and your opinion from that, reading it in the book? I don't know. I always got a sort of uneasy feeling about it. Like, it felt like a con. Mm -hmm. Like, if they did actually go through it, then they were sort of led through it or, you know, had it suggested. Yeah. It was not, not an organic thing. Like, I don't think they got together one day and went, do you know what? I'd really quite like to sacrifice my soul to the devil just for a laugh. <laughs> you know? Oh, totally. Why not? Totally. You know, it's Tuesday. Let's have a go. Well, I I believe that. Um, I know. <laughs> Sounds like a great thing to do today. <laughs> exactly. You know, I mean, I've got half an hour. <laughs> well, and that's also the I'll thing. just, you know, sacrifice my soul. Why not? Oh, my God. <laughs> well, that totally ties into what Bill said. Like, they, they did they did this pact without really knowing or caring about exactly. the words they Exactly. Well, it said. must be. Because if they'd honestly known yeah. or even suspected yeah. that one or both of them would die you know, horribly or abruptly, mm. you know, young and all the rest of it, I don't think they would have gone through with it. Yeah. Like, there's another bit in the book where it says, you know, um, was it Vernon Mosher? Yes. Or Mosher? Mosher. Mosher, I think is how you pronounce it, isn't it? Yes. Yeah, Vernon Mosher, I think he says, um, you know, have you prayed to Satan or whatever? It's like, and John goes, oh, well, yeah, but it didn't mean anything. I'm like, can you honestly, genuinely see John doing that without being very heavily leaned on. Right. He could have been intoxicated, too, at the time. (laughs) You know, we don't know. Drunk, drugged, you know, psychologically leaned on in some capacity. And, you know, I find it peculiar. I cannot find any information about Vernon E. Mosher anywhere. Like, I know he was Kenneth Anger's crony, um, but I really... I have a hard time finding information about him. And I just, I don't know. He's kind of a mysterious character <laughs> to me. Uh, yeah. I don't know. Like, Yeah. Well, he's in there a few times, isn't he? He's yeah. in there. He's in there talking to Paul and John mm-hmm. uh, about the pact. And then again about dreams. And the Rolling um, Stones. And he, it, yeah. He says, you know, you've only got, is it, 15 months or whatever it is 18 months to live and all this sort of stuff and then and then you hear from him again later on was he when uh Ugh, that sounds yeah when 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 billy and brian jones and uh uh kenneth anger and stuff that they're, they're together in hyde park he's in there quite a few times right and i have to think if he was part of um you know mi6 or the cia you know like if yeah. he had intelligence connections and was like, like you said, sort of manipulating them to do this. Yeah, I I don't yeah. know. <laughs> I don't know, but all of that feels really suspicious. It does. It does, and it it does feel really suspicious. Like they were led into something. Mm-hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And then we caught, of course. The seance. Mm, Do you want to talk about the seance? Um, sure. You know, um, <laughs> the guys uh, on, in November of 1966, they sat down at a table. Ringo was absent. Um, and they had, what, six, six chairs set up? Uh, yeah, because it was Billy, George, John... And then there was Mick and Brian Jones. and was it and Brian Jones? Yeah, yeah, it was two of the Stones were there as well. And then Paul. And then a spare space for Paul. Yeah. Yeah. And then all of a sudden, Bill starts uh, talking in Paul's voice, and the guys kind of flip out. <laughs> yes. And it take this brother, may it serve you well. Yes. 
And I love how it mentions, you know, cry, baby, cry in the book, you know, the connection to his John Lennon's little verse about a midnight seance in the dark. <laughs> that's right. Yeah. Yeah. And that's that's where we get Hey Jude from. Mm. It, the story of Hey Jude is about, in part, that seance, like you said earlier, about suddenly Paul you know, was on his shoulder Mm -hmm. and he felt him on his shoulder. Yeah. And that they've been attached ever since. Well, and then he also talks about how he had to learn not to imitate Paul, but to be Paul. (laughs) I find that kind of curious too. You know, like, I just find the whole thing curious. Is it real? You know, did he really channel Paul? You know, the guys were like, oh, that's convenient. You know, (laughs) like, Oh, yeah, that was Ringo. It's like, yeah, yeah, Paul said it's okay if I take all of his worldly possessions and all of his money and his house and his girlfriend. Yeah, he said it's totally fine. (laughs) And Ringo's like, yeah, Yeah. well, we've only got your word for that, haven't we, Bill? (laughs) Exactly. Yeah, I mean, and it's true. That's all we do have. But I, I have to think that as much as Billy talks about it in this book, man, he's like, I have to think that the spiritual connection is real. It it seems like it because there's just so much information. Like that is basically uh, one of the main pillars of this book is that spiritual connection with Billy and Paul, you know, and the merging of them to be this one entity. Oh, it's, <laughs> it's a lot to take in. For sure. It is a lot to take in. It's kind of weird and also mm. doesn't make sense why you'd ever want to do that. But then everyone involved seems to have been conditioned into it. So, right. I mean, um, you know, what do you think about the, um, I, you know, the idea about, you know, Satan being a political network that was designed by social engineers, you know, like, what do you think about how they're using Satanism to change the minds of people? Um, like, what do you think about that? I suppose it may, it depends, mm. doesn't it, on what you mean by Satanism? Well, uh, so I think I think by Satanism, Bill in the book is referring to a sort of um, Luciferian. Well, mm. no, no, not even that. Quite the opposite, uh, in fact. The Luciferian stuff is for the elite. Mm. That's their own thing because they're the illumined ones. Mm. Um, and we're just, you know, the swine down at the bottom. Yes. No, I think the, the Satanism thing is more about a sort of uh, hedonism mm-hmm. and putting yourself at the center of everything. You know, it's service to self. Right. It's that whole idea yeah. and the whole of your world revolving around yourself. Right almost like you're in worship of yourself Mm -hmm. so i think that's the particular kind of brand of satanism that they're talking about yeah in part at least i know there's different ones you know there's the agnostics and the atheists satanists and yeah the people who follow the the doctrines and all of that it's like yeah and it's just like christianity you like lump all of them in together (laughs) you know and call it call it that I don't know yeah I just think it's um I think it that's the scariest part of the book about about this you know it's just learning how much we're influenced by these ideals and we are being brainwashed to think a certain way you know, and it's sad to see the world just kind of go into shit and go going down the toilet <laughs> for it. You can swear. You know? I don't mind. <laughs> I just try not to yeah. because if I start, no, you, you won't can't stop. hold me back. <laughs> no, I won't stop. Once It'll I just start, be a swear fest. I won't stop. <laughs> swear fest. <laughs> oh boy, I'd like to go to that one. <laughs> the concert. <laughs> <laughs> swear fest. The swear fest. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, I don't know. It, it all seems very weird, and Satanism seems to have crept into things where it shouldn't have done. 
that's for sure. Like you were you were talking about hedonism and that just makes me think of it's like how Dionysus is mentioned so much too, you know, the hedonism and debauchery and do what thou wilt. You know, it's all tied in there. It's I just find it interesting that these um characters and history and stuff like come up so much in the book, you know. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah, are they interesting. Well, it is weird how they sort of cross over mm. sort of different mythologies and sort of spiritual practices or religions or you know whatever. Yeah. They they have all these different ideas. Very disparate, in fact, ideas. Yeah. And they just pull them together, throw them together, and that's a new thing. <laughs> yeah. And it's so weird because they've taken a whole load of what I would consider sort of folklore mm. with it. And it's sort of like, you know, I mean, that seance, for example, that happened just after the Halloween and the Faustian bargain that they made, supposedly, right. Paul and John. That was like, I think, a week before Halloween. So obviously that sort of particular time of year, you know, the idea is that uh, that the, the veil between worlds mm. is thin and you can sort of communicate to the other side. That's the whole idea. That's why they did it at that time of year, I guess, mm -hmm. on both occasions. And I don't know, it's it's sort of odd because if I think I know Halloween is really big where you are. Yeah. And it's sort of sort of become halfway big here mm. in England. It's certainly a lot bigger than it was when I was a kid. It was a almost a fringe celebration when mm. I was very small. Yeah. Um but if I think about what that's on top of uh, which is Zawan, that's nothing like it. I mean, Zawan celebrates the dead in the sense of, you know, celebrating your your lost family and friends, you know, your departed loved ones. Mm -hmm. And it's a much more respectful. It's like the de los muertos. Exactly. Yeah. It's like Oban, in fact, in Japan, mm. um, which is in August, in fact. and you you go and you would you know a attend their graves and you would have in your house um a sort of shrine for them and you know it it's remembrance mm -hmm. it's it's not about creepy costumes and horror films <laughs> <laughs> I know. it's about honoring the dead and you'd like even set out food for them mm -hmm. you know in the same way that you would for like hungry ghost ceremonies mm -hmm. that you have in certain Eastern traditions. And in Zawan, which is essentially, you know, Celtic, largely Irish, Scottish sort of thing, mm -hmm. you would do the same thing. You would set out, traditionally, you would set out a place for them to come and eat with you and have a meal oh. as an act of remembrance. So... It seems a very long way between those sort of folk traditions yeah. and Halloween. <laughs> so what I have been told, though, too, with um, like, and I don't know if this is the Druids or um, I, I had an idea in my head it was the Celts, but, um, you know, the, the candy and the treats was used to keep the bad spirits away and the costumes and the masks were meant to blend in with the spirit so they wouldn't attack yeah. you and then the jack-o-lantern was made to look like a head <laughs> like a, a beheaded head to scare off the um spirit well i think i think the whole trick or treat thing mm. actually comes from the mama plays okay so you would have these little folk plays where you dressed up as a character mm -hmm. and you would be head to toe dressed as that character mm -hmm. So that you could not be seen at all, not even your face. Um, and I think they've gone from that to the the dressing up at Halloween. Mm -hmm. Because you would normally have, if, if say you were in a village, you would have a big bonfire, the same as you would for Beltane. Mm -hmm. You'd have a big bonfire and you'd have a big get together. You'd have a meal together with everybody in your environment. And 
everybody in a village would donate things, you know, food or drink or whatever, to the festival. And you would knock on doors to collect things for the festival. Mm. So that's where you get the trick or treat from. Gotcha. It's not for it's not for candy. Mm. It, it it's for a celebration, a communal celebration. Yeah. So I think you've got disparate again folk ideas and traditions blended together and taken into a really different direction. That's my interpretation anyway. Yeah. And you would normally have lanterns that were made from things like turnips mm -hmm. rather than pumpkins mm. or but pumpkins are bigger and they're much more impressive and they're easier to carve mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so yeah that's what it's become yeah it's, it's fascinating i mean that's like what it what that's history you know different cultures different ideas they all mesh together eventually <laughs> you know and and make something new with the blend of them both um i think that's fascinating Thank you for yeah. sharing. I didn't know that, actually. So, oh, very well, cool. There you go. Yeah. And I remember also, I haven't done this since I was little, but I do remember my dad was massively fond of barn brack, and we'd hide things in it. It's like a bread. It's like a fruit bread. Yes, I've heard of it. And you'd hide things in it, Isn't it and you'd cut it up, a bit like you would maybe uh, with a Christmas pudding. Don't you put a baby cheese hide... in it? Or something. <laughs> I've heard no, that. no, no. You would hide things like a ring or something, <laughs> or a coin or something like yeah. that. You would hide things in it, and then you would cut it up and hand it out. And then, what, depending on what item you had, mm. would be an indication of the luck you have in store. Oh, I love that. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah, I, I've so... I've heard of a different tradition of that, and I don't know where where what it is, but they put like a baby Jesus in the in a piece of bread that they bake, and if you get that piece with the baby Jesus, you're like you have fortune and all that all year. <laughs> so okay, that's why I said that earlier. But that's a new one on me. <laughs> I like the uh, I like the other one. I like the one you did. That's really cool. Okay, yeah. That's more traditional, yeah, yeah. yeah. And you'd have other things like you'd have um, at a bonfire, if you had a communal bonfire, mm -hmm. you would cast stones mm. and then once the fire had gone out, you would find your stone and if it was missing, it meant you weren't going to live to see the next Zalwain. Oh my goodness. <laughs> so there was creepy stuff there too. Yeah, super creepy. <laughs> Yeah, but a lot of it was to do with, like, who you were going to hook up with and stuff. Oh, yeah. You know, like, you'd have, um, you would roast um, things like um, hazelnuts. Mm. You'd have one for yourself and one for the person that you fancied. <laughs> and if 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 they both roasted properly together, oh my God. it meant you were a, a match made in heaven. And, and if one popped out and just disappeared, you know, rolled down the hill... Then uh, it was. It's not to be. It sucks to be you. <laughs> that's, that's so funny. Yeah, oh, I wow. I love all the folk traditions. I love. Yeah, it. I do too. I think that's awesome. <laughs> you know, that's where we get apple bobbing from because apples are to do with wisdom. Yes. And immortality. Mm -hmm. So a hazelnuts there to do with wisdom. If you know anything about sort of traditional Celtic stories, particularly Irish stories, I don't. You you you'll hear them come up quite frequently in the folklore. Mm. So yeah, I love all that. Yeah, it's fascinating. I do too. I think it's neat to learn about all that. Okay, so I'm going to go back. We're going to talk about hexing oneself. Oh. Okay. 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 Let's talk about hexing yourself, because I think Billy has hexed himself, and though I don't think he meant to. How? <laughs> because if you read memoirs, page 79, he talks about um, saving your voice, basically, and singing properly and breathing properly and all of this stuff. 
and that if he'd carried on trying to sing exactly like Paul, he would have ruined his voice. And he talks about the fact that, um, oh. you know, even even at his you know advanced age, I think at the time he must have been what seventy or something yeah. um, when he wrote it mm. um, or had it written about him. He's like, oh, I can still outsing Paul, and I think he hexed himself. Because he definitely, definitely can't. He called Paul throaty. <laughs> <laughs> he had a throaty sound because he didn't sing from his diaphragm. <laughs> and now listen to yeah. Bill singing at a concert nowadays. <laughs> exactly. I, I think he cursed himself by saying that in a book. He made a public declaration that, oh, no, I'm brilliant and I can out sing Paul yeah. even at my advanced age. And you should never say that. You can you've you've tempted fate. Yes, I that is by saying stuff like that. That's amazing. I believe in stuff like that. You know, I think that if you attract something, you know, if you put something negative out there in the world, it'll come back and bite you in the ass, in the ass eventually. Absolutely. Oh my goodness. Yeah. So, but then again if you take that concept into consideration with this whole replacement conspiracy, he hasn't really had his ass kicked yet <laughs> by, by the karma. Oh, don't worry. I think it's waiting for him. I think that was a taste. Yo. <laughs> I, I think that was universal law going, really, Bill? Mm. Here's a taste of what's coming up for you. <laughs> because I'm sorry. I mean, I, I I I give props to him for still going at it, but it's like Madonna. You kind of need to like hang your hat up and you know call it a day because <laughs> you've done you've done yeah. your lot. Although I don't think Madonna's actually Madonna anymore. Oh my person. No, she she is a whole other topic and discussion yes let's not get into that wow. i think there's like at least two or three madonnas now so oh my god <laughs> let's not get into that yeah i've got enough work with one replacement <laughs> never mind another one <laughs> true that she just looks so scary nowadays I'm like, anyways okay whoever she is yeah, whoever yes she is. <laughs> whoever she is yes. lady madonna so. right <laughs> Yeah, something like that. So yeah, yes. I mean, I believe in hexes. Like, I don't know about hexes, but um, I believe in like, yeah, what you. I believe in karma, you know, and you shouldn't laugh at other people's misfortunes or think you're superior to others because, you know, and and that's totally contradictory to what he says too about how he can't relate to people because they idolize him. Well, you go around acting like Mr. Superior Rockstar the whole time. Like, what are we going to do? You know, I it's yeah. Actually, talking about his voice. Yeah. What I've always really wondered is what his real voice, his real accent yes. actually sounds Me like. Me too. I would love, too. dearly love, all joking aside, mm. I would dearly love to actually hear him speak in his own voice. Because mm. I think that's probably the one voice I've never heard. Right. The man of a thousand We've voices. heard him speak in all sorts of voices and accents and things, yeah. but never his own. Yeah, that's so true. You know, he says he's closer to Vivian Stanchel, right? His mannerisms and that's how he is. So I have to think maybe he's a little posh. I don't know. That could be. But I do think, you know, he talks about Scotland a lot. Maybe yeah. he has a Scottish accent because there are a couple of occasions where he slips into that. I think actually by accident, there's one time I can't remember what talk show it was, but I saw him on a talk show and just it was literally for one word. He just accidentally said a word in a hmm. Scottish accent hmm. Interesting. and then slipped straight back out of it. And he was he was being Paul, mm. so there was no reason to do it, and it was literally for one word, and it and it looked like an accident, mm. like he caught himself. Wow! And of course, also the first song that he recorded as Paul was uh, I think when I'm sixty four, yes. and when you listen to I think it's the uh, the middle eight, uh, grandchildren on your knee, mm. 
He sings that with a Scottish accent. Grandchildren on their knee. Yes. That's the one. Yeah. Oh, wow. He does. He sings it with a Scottish accent. And I've always wondered mm. why that was. I've always thought it was really weird. He does have some weird pronunciations in his songs. Yes. I, I, yeah. I agree. I would love, I would have loved to known Bill before McCartney. <laughs> I wish we could get more information about his childhood and his upbringing, you know. The, yeah. I don't know, is he the son of the magician? That's what I was going to ask you. <laughs> Ooh, oh, I was literally looking at that written down on my paper. That's creepy. <laughs> That's <Yeah>. creepy, creepy. <laughs> Just as you said that, I read oh, it. Oh my goodness. Yeah. Doo -doo -doo -doo. I know, right? <laughs> right back at me. Is he though? What well, what do you think? Do you think he is the son of the magician? I personally do, yes. Um, I just think that there is so much uh coincidences. <laughs> I don't know. There's just so much influence from Crowley through Billy and he talks about him, you know, and even the anagram, the being a cosmania trying to mm. subtly put it out there where the general public wouldn't even pay attention to it. You know, um, yeah. I, I do think he is. I think he's the illegitimate child of Crowley. Yes. What about yeah. you? I think it's, I think it's pretty likely. Yeah. He even says I his cousins. I say one way or the other, but it's likely. He says his cousins are the bushes, you know, like... <laughs> Well, yeah, he tries to put that or out his, because of Barbara Bush. Or his nephew, or yeah, his nephew. He says he says he says that they're relatives because he was talking, I think, about nine eleven, yes. and he was sad that relatives were involved. Yes. Yeah. So that's that's the connection, yeah, isn't it? It is. Yeah. Yeah. Barbara Barbara Bush is Alistair Crowley with the wig on. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's kind of what she looked like. Yes. <laughs> What do you think? Yeah. Well, there's a lot of theories about her, isn't there? Uh, that that mm. she's not really a she. and Really? Yeah. I've never heard that theory before. <laughs> oh, well, there's, there's, there's so much gender bending oh my gosh. and blending I know. that I think everybody assumes every person who presents as a woman is actually a man. <laughs> well, actually. <laughs> oh, although, to be honest, that happens a lot now, so <laughs> you never know. <laughs> oh, my goodness. I know. So, I mean, what do you think yeah. about um, him being the son of Crowley? In what sense? Well, what do I do think? You, do you think he is the son of the magician? Probably, yes. Yeah. But who who really knows? I know. He wants to be, I think. Could Even if he isn't. He could be a red herring. You know, you never know. Yes. He wants to be. <laughs> I think I do think he wants to yeah. be. Yeah. He definitely admires him, that's for sure. You you see that for sure. Yeah. So it's it's the sort of Scottish connection mm. and Crowley, those are the things I've tried to sort of bring together and I, I that's where it always is difficult mm -hmm. when I've looked at his bloodlines. I've I've tried to sort of think, well, He's got this Scottish thing, possibly an Irish thing going on. He says that in the book, mm -hmm. that he's also the son of Crowley and granted that, you know, he put it about, as it were, you know, yeah. he wasn't shy, was nope. he? Um, <laughs> you know, he, he, he could have been a one night stand, you know. Exactly. Or a ri Billy could ritual, have... you know, an orgy. <laughs> yeah, or a ritual. Some, I've heard, you know, the theory that he could be a moon child. So, coming from a moon yeah, ritual. which doesn't make any sense to me because he really should be a sun child. Yeah. Because he's Horus, mm. he's a sun god. Yeah. <laughs> you know, yep. I mean, Randall, which was it, um, the child that Crowley had yes. with the girl Pat. Yes, this... He was a sun child. Exactly. He talks about his uh, rituals that he did with Pat, mm -hmm. Deirdre. Yeah. Um, he talks about them all the time in his diaries of that time, mm -hmm. and because they have, they had to conceive him in the August of nineteen thirty six, 
and it had to be you know done in a preci- precise kind of way yeah in order for it to be legit as it were mm-hmm. and yeah i just think well that should have been bill mm. i do find the timing on that really odd because randall was born 2nd of may 1937 we're told Bill is born in 1937. Mm. I do. I have wondered in the past whether or not he was actually a twin. Oh, mm. But when you look at pictures of Randall, yeah. they don't particularly look no, alike. Not at all. So, yeah, I don't know. Well, maybe they had They're Randall really first, the sun child, and then they had Bill, the the moon child. I'm not sure. I don't even know if that's if that was the case. But you know, well, not not with Pat. She can't have a child in May of 1937 and then another one. Right. I don't know. People think his birthday was in September. Mm. But I think they're guessing. <laughs> um, but certainly if his birthday is in September, then you can't have a child in May and then another one in September. Right, right. Because that's biologically impossible. impossible. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> You're very special if you can pull that oh, one off. It's a miracle <laughs> child. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Uh-huh. Yeah. Mm. It's funny. So yeah. there you go. So we've been talking for a bit over an hour. Yes, we have. It's been fun. Do you want to? Do you want to call it a day, or yeah. do you want to talk about something else? We can call it a day. Um, I think we had a nice chit chat. I hope everybody out there enjoyed it. <laughs> Let us know in the comments what you guys think. We enjoy reading your comments and good or bad it's fun to interact <laughs> just please be respectful goodness <laughs> yeah we do this as a bit of fun really yes, totally because it's good to just have a bit of fun with a very serious subject sometimes yes, definitely is and you know we uh always have a lot to talk about so <laughs> yeah fun stuff but yeah okay. I, I would say We'll call it a day. Happy Halloween, everybody. And be safe out there. Yeah. Bye, everybody. All right. Goodbye.